good morning all. Uh, today we have the session on palliative medicine in corporate hospitals. Uh, Dr. Sushma is unable to join today because she is traveling. Uh, today our session is moderated by Dr. Pranit Suvari. Uh, he is a consultant at the Department of Pain and Palliative Medicine, Indo-American Cancer Hospital and Research Institute, Hyderabad. He has several publications in national and international journals. His areas of interest are end-of-life care, refractory pain, and malignant ascites. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pranit Sovaji, to this session. Uh, we request you to uh, introduce the speaker and also to moderate the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, IAPC and Nisha, for the opportunity. Nisha, uh, yeah, uh, so Dr. Divya is a, a second-year DNP resident, uh, joined uh, last year. She's very passionate, uh, very sincere uh, working uh, resident. She's taken palliative medicine out of choice. Uh, so she wanted to uh, do something different um, and uh, has a passion to do always uh, learn something new. So she's doing very well in her uh, residency currently. So all the best to her and uh, uh, all the best for today's presentation as well. The way you can start the presentation. Yeah, please proceed. Slideshow, put it in the slideshow. So, is it possible? Yeah, yeah, please, please start the presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, today's uh, presentation is on. Palliative Care in Corporate Hospitals, moderated by Dr. Pranit, sir. We'll be going through the background and rationale, defining palliative care and its benefit to community oncology, how to start a palliative care program at a corporate hospital, and how can palliative care help in a multi-speciality corporate, the facilitators and barriers to the referral, what a successful integration of uh, the services mean, quality indicators, and is this helping or harming the ecosystem? And finally, about the financial aspects. So we'll be briefly going to two cases. So first one, she is a 67-year-old female patient with a CA breast with a severe metastasis to brain, liver, and uh, she has progressed over several lines of chemo. And she now presented to the ER with uh, shortness of breath, established by the primary consultant, but the family on having an aggressive management because they could afford ICU care. She was intubated eventually and was on CPAP along with vasopressors, gradually deflated delirium, so she had to be sedated so that her family would just come to see her once a day with a hope that she'll recover. But she finally succumbed to death in ICU after five days. So a uh, question here is, uh, did she have to suffer and die ultimately? because she, her family could afford ICU care, or could she have all the comfort needed at the end of life and die peacefully along with her family, among her family members? So case discussion two, she is a 54-year-old female with the carcinoma gallbladder, post PPD stenting, chemo, and progressive disease. She presented with features of intractable vomiting, decreased appetite, bilateral pedal edema, PTBD in, uh, insertion leak, insomnia, lethargia, but the family decided to go for best supportive care without further aggressive measures, despite the fact that they can afford ICU care. So here, multidisciplinary care has been provided to the patient as well as family. Psychotherapeutic consults have been sought. She was given ultimate care and finally breathed her last in, in the middle of her family members. So we can see these two case scenarios wherein one, despite being affordable, preferred palliative care and a corporate hospital. The other one, in spite of being affordable, they still wanted to get aggressive measures done, even though the patient couldn't make it. So both of these case scenarios lead us to a point where that one has chosen comfort measures, the other one has chosen severe aggressive measures and died. So uh, most of the times we get to see that the rich patients have uh, you know, access to more of the healthcare systems and they eventually die a painful death in the ICU. Whereas uh, poor patients usually 
they do not they cannot afford icu care and they eventually get palliative care services needed and die a peaceful death in middle of their family so both of them give us a thinking scenario wherein uh, how the palliative care services is widely available to the poor and most of the rich are unable to access it just because they have an option of affording icu care so the national medical uh, uh, council of india in 2019 uh, have made this uh, additions to the 2015 uh, consensus that has been formed by uh, the intensivist, palliative physician, and neurologist regarding the end of life care. So, all of these three departments constitute the steering committee of this body, and they hoped to partner with both public and private agencies to develop the ecosystem for the caring of terminally ill patients. Where here we can see that. There is a partnership of both public as well as private agencies. So the tasks ahead included creating a legal framework for end-of-life care decision-making, both by the individuals as well as the institutions, raising public awareness and normalizing death in day-to-day -day disclosure, creating capacity in healthcare system for providing adequate end-of-life care or palliative care service. Specialist palliative service is available only in 14% of the global population worldwide, with over 56 million people estimated to require palliative care annually and 25 million requiring end of life. Whereas in India, the estimated population are 5.5 requiring palliative care and 4.5 requiring end of life care. The Lancet Commission report estimates that 7 million Indians need palliative care and not all palliative care patients are end of life and many have basic palliative care needs. And most of the time we see that the palliative care in the government setup is specially dedicated to oncology. And defining palliative care and its benefit to the community oncology. The Center to Advance Palliative Care defines it as specialized medical care for people living with serious illness. According to ASCO, it has aimed to improve the quality of life of the patients and family living with cancer by addressing pain. Also, the chronic illnesses are included. Address the pain, symptoms, functional limitations, communication about the prognosis, assessing the illness, clarifying treatment goals, providing support for coping with the serious illnesses, assisting with transitions of care and palliative care has to be provided by the interdisciplinary team. In the oncology setting, uh, palliative care can be used at any stage of the illness, be it from the time of the diagnosis of a serious illness till the end of life and also followed by uh, bereavement support. So it goes concurrently along with the curative as well as the disease modifying cancer therapies. The evidence suggests that early referral in the outpatient setting is important to improve the quality of life, include early end of life care uh, conversations, the effectiveness of palliative care in the ICU during the transition of the care, and uh, palliative care emergencies, wherein we try to do the physical and emotional symptom management, trying to decrease the caregiver distress and also document the outcome of early palliative care. Thus, the provision here in the palliative care is based on the needs of the patient rather than on the prognosis. So what are the different delivery models we see at a corporate setup? One is an inpatient consultation. The other is an inpatient primary admitting service with or without a designated physical space or a unit. An outpatient clinic, either within a target specialty or standalone OPD clinic a daycare service, outreach, or a home care service. So the inpatient consultation includes the hospital-based metrics like uh, the ICU length of stay or the readmission rate, facilitation of discussion about the goals of care, preferences, transition from a disease-directed plan to a comfort-focused plan, varying from an ICU to a palliative, palliative to a hospice-based, and trying to do an adequate symptom management. And inpatient admitting, uh, the above said consultation needs along with the desire to hand off the patients from the medical, surgical and ICU services. It is a physical space where uh, which can be created in order to care for the actively dying patients. 
The consultative service has a potential to build the capacity of other staff as well, wherein we try to train the nurses in uh, managing acute pain, as well as doing the symptom burden, trying to counsel the families regarding what is happening and uh, how the prognosis could be. In an outpatient uh, setting, we can do a symptom management, support the conversation regarding goals of care, try to do an advanced care plan, and disease or malignancy specific integration, because in the medical oncology OPD, it is difficult for us to expect where uh, the disease uh, related aspects, the concerns of the patient and their families are not usually elicited. The deep uh, psychosocial issues of the patient are not elicited. And uh, all of this can be done on an outpatient setting. Also in this uh, format, we try to ensure that the patient is on a regular follow up with us, not only for the symptom control, we make sure that the patient visits us during every stage of the disease that he's coming for the chemo or the respective radiation therapy, where we try to make sure and see and how the patient's disease trajectory is progressing from the beginning of the illness or till the point of where he is right now. And all of this, we make sure that there is a very good doctor-patient relationship, trying to make sure that the trust is built over the time, wherein... Uh, not towards the, uh, see, where we try to do that, uh, the palliative physician is not coming at the end of life just before the patient's death and trying to paint an overall different picture saying that we are taking care. Rather, we try to do that by inculcating a palliative service in a corporate setup early on. We make sure that the, along with the treating oncologist, the palliative physician is also there. We try to ensure them that this is not end of life and we make sure that their cancer journey is done smoothly. All of these doubts are created on an uh, outpatient setting where we make sure that the rapport is maintained from the beginning of the illness, wherein our involvement becomes maximal at the end of life. And a palliative daycare service. So uh, this daycare service can be embedded to an outpatient clinic where presenting with acute symptoms, they can be stabilized. This is more like a respite for a caregivers where, for example, they can, uh, someone presenting with a malignant ascites, they can get the scan done and immediately followed by an ascitic tap, stabilization and then relieving them off rather than going for a inpatient admission. So uh, a daycare can also play an important social role in providing food, companionship and rehabilitative functions as well. So uh, the list of indications for specialty palliative care, we have a needs-based criteria and a time-based criteria. So coming to the needs-based criteria, we have uh, first one is the, as you all know, severe physical symptom burden as well as emotional symptom burden and the request for hasten death, which means uh, there are uh, psychosocial symptoms as well elicited by the patient spiritual and existential crisis. So existential crisis is the question of why me? What is the purpose of this life? And healthcare decision-making, goals of care, advanced care planning, the request of the patient, deliriousness, neurological complications of cancer such as or leptomeningeal metastasis, spinal cord compression, or coda equina syndrome. Coming to the time-based criteria, within three months of the diagnosis with advanced or metastatic cancer with a median survival of less than one month, diagnosis of an advanced cancer with progression despite two lines of systemic chemotherapy. So this needs-based criteria and time-based criteria are one of the major indications for a specialty palliative care center requirement. So uh, how do we start a new palliative uh, care uh, service in a corporate hospital? First, we try to conduct a needs-based assessment depending on hospital to hospital. Say if the hospital is pertaining exclusively to cancer setup or it is a multidisciplinary hospital encompassing the departments of cardiology, pulmonology, endocrinology, uh, such multi-speciality hospital does require a palliative care service and uh, pediatric and exclusive pediatric so we try to conduct a needs-based assessment. We define the priorities and the target population that we have to recruit under these services. We seek the support of the hospital management and the senior uh, practitioners. Identify the lead person in taking the initiative within the hospital, sensitizing the hospital staff and the philosophy and the need for palliative care, trying to educate them. Educating the educated is the difficult part, especially in a corporate setup. And uh, 
we try to conduct awareness programs and try to uh, tell them the need and the necessity of palliative care and uh, making efforts in increasing the public awareness campaign, identifying the gaps in the hospital infrastructure, establishing a budget for the setup, and not just making a budget, but also trying to understand the recurrent costs it has, and trying to build the links with other healthcare professionals, like medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, be, in the, be on their good books, and try to encourage reference establishing a, a guided protocols for reference and also the registration of the patient, ensuring that the patients accept this type of palliative model in the setting, educating the patient themselves to understand that palliative does not mean the doctor is giving up. Then we try to monitor and evaluate whether these objectives are being met or not. So the implementation timeline for palliative service includes resource allocation, wherein we try to get the required uh, uh, equipment, both for the hospital required medications and the care delivery setting, whether we're trying to deliver the care in an outpatient setting, inpatient, take care, emergency setting, and staffing scheme, where we try to allocate the staff in managing pain. Suppose, uh, there is a pain in a peripheral, uh, pa uh, a patient who is admitted in a medical oncology ward. And then uh, who is going to take care of the patient? So the, a sister who is trained in pain titration has to go and take care of the patient. So there have to be sisters assigned to take care of the patients elsewhere and sisters dedicatedly assigned to take care of the patients pain as well as symptom management within the inpatient staff admission, where we try to allocate the staff in trying to or uh, cater the requirements of patient admitted in different wards, say ICU, say emergency department, say in any other ward with the pain management. So we try to make sure that each one is designated with the respective roles in trying to manage the patient. The steering committee consists of uh, excellent leadership, chief nursing officers, financial aspects, communications, pharmacy, uh, psychosocial and spiritual king, care, uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation, dietetic support, and complementary services. Prior to the initiation of palliative service, it is important that we clarify the operational standards around the service hours, evening on-call duties, weekend coverage, the time frame within which we have to see a new referral, the follow-up frequency and the duration, communication process for referral sources, uh, and other bedside caregivers, routine team workflows such as clinical hurdles, interdisciplinary meetings, and the expectations that are uh, either met or not, and facilitating the palliative com uh, care team communication within the team, effective communication has to be done. So uh, what is the minimum staffing that is required for a hospital-based palliative care service? Firstly, we need a doctor who is trained in palliative care and in the communication skills with a minimum course with a theoretical component for at least 10 days practically and ideally a specialist qualification. The doctor has to be there uh, full time or part time depending upon the workload. And the nurses are required who is trained in the palliative uh, care training for at least 10 days and specialized training in palliative is also preferred. Full time nurses are required. Psychologists or counselors uh, who are trained with an orientation to the specific needs of the palliative care, regular or visiting, full-time psycho uh, psychotherapist is needed. And uh, palliative care nursing aides, a pharmacist can be a part-time, social workers, full-time or part-time, who is trained with an orientation to the special needs of palliative care, wherein they, if, if in a pediatric ward, say the role of a social worker would be try to uh, make sure that the child, if there are any important occasions for the family or the child, make sure that a small celebration is done so that uh, the family or the uh, child has enough time with each other and the child's wishes are also met. So how can uh, palliative service help in different specialties in a multi-speciality uh, corporate? So uh, when we say, suppose, uh, we not only have a central role in the delivery of high care quality care, but also uh, initially palliative care providers were oncologists. So most of the time people think that palliative is only restricted to oncologists, oncology setup, while palliative 
also has a wide role in multi specialty setup like uh, say in a pediatric ward a neonatal care unit a child born with congenital anomalies a child who could not make it till uh, viability or uh, a child with uh, stroke cerebral palsy dystonia coming to another uh, um, specialties where uh, chronic kidney diseases at the time where we try to make sure that the patient Patient has to be transferred into a conservative kidney management. Uh, heart failure patients, COPD patients. For all of these long-term illnesses, palliative care can be incorporated into a multi-specialty corporate. So, what are the barriers to the palliative referral? First is the physician barriers, where uh, the physician is often confused for palliative care equating with end of life or hospice care. And they also have trouble articulating it to the patient why they are making a palliative referral and what are the outcomes that the patient has to expect from the referral. And uh, end of life care is a critical part of palliative care. It is only a part of uh, what a palliative care envelopes. They usually equate it to end of life care. And this knowledge deficit about what palliative and end of life care is, is essential for the treating physician to know so that they can have a proper referral and also uh, make sure that the expected goals are met for the patient. And also a belief that palliative care is alternative to oncology and it is not compatible with the current aggressive anti-cancer measure. This is another misconception. And the distress of oncologists to the palliative providers with the belief that certain topics such as prognosis, Goals of care are solely the domain of uh, oncology clinicians. And also the fear of upres, upsetting other oncology multidisciplinary team members. Like if the medical oncologist is upset that the radiation colleague has involved a palliative team. And also a belief that the academic palliative models do not translate well into a community-based setting. And this is the most common myth wherein the practicing oncologist often say, but I do palliative care. This belief may be another barrier to the palliative referral and many of the oncologists may not have time during their routine office hour visits to address the broader psychosocial issues related to the suffering, coping mechanisms that affect the patients with cancers and their families. All of this cannot be elicited. I do palliative care is such a vague term wherein uh, the needs of palliative care are not just pertaining to symptom, physical symptom burden, wherein the psychosocial aspect, financial aspects, and further advanced care plan is such a deep topic that it cannot be addressed in one sitting. Coming to the patient factors, where the patient feels that he is being abandoned by the primary physician, and they equate palliative care to that. They have morphine phobia. They think that the physician is giving morphine and they're only trying to kill me. Branding and naming. So uh, given that the palliative care grew out of uh, Cicely Saunders hospice movement, some of the educated people, they equate palliative care to death, dying, and only hospice services, which is not true. So other issues include the healthcare policy, reimbursement mechanisms to facilitate efficient implementation early in the disease trajectory and insurance coverage for palliative care. Most of the insurance do not cover palliative care needs wherein the patient's family has to shell extra money for palliative services, ethical dilemmas, framing end of life care policies in the institutions regarding withholding or withdrawing a life support, fear of legally being bound to ethical issues. So uh, the framing of an end of life care policy is most of the time, uh, even though there are adequate guidelines out there, but then it is uh, the institution based end of life care policies, wherein most of the institutions, they do not have this policy at the time uh, and also a proper time and a proper palliative care, wherein at this particular time, there is a, when there is a requirement of a palliative service, they do not do that because of the poor end of life care policies and they make sure that the patient is giving, getting the treatment that uh, even though he is not that responding, they are making sure that only the patient is getting treatment despite the response just because they do not have a palliative facility and the hospital do not have a legal end of life care framework. 
so the this is the article 21 which is protection of life and personal liberty no person here shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to the procedure established by the law this fundamental right is available to every person citizen and foreigners it states that life merely is not an act of physical breathing so what are the facilitators to the referent patient and family facilitators a public opinion survey established that few patients who understand what palliative care is and when we appropriately educated them about what services palliative can provide most of them are willing to have palliative care for themselves as well as their loved ones and the reasons oncologists refer patients for palliative care they are most likely to refer for the assistance with complex pain symptom management completion of a specialty palliative care rotation uh, during their medical oncology or surgical oncology training will increase the likelihood of the referral when they themselves become practitioners so at our hospital also we are making sure that the super specialty as well as the specialty postgraduates are getting a 15 day mandatory palliative training where they try to see the un the underlying core concepts of what palliative is the baseline symptom burden and how we are trying to palliate their psychosocial issues as well so that uh, they get to identify which patient is in need of palliative care and uh, However, numerous altitudinal, educational, structural barriers do exist. How do we facilitate a smooth palliative incorporation in a corporate setting? So one should organize meetings, schedule presentations for the stakeholders like the institutional heads, shared governance teams, medical and nursing staff education and care management. All of these engagements serve several functions by creating a forum in order to address the existing gap in understanding about what palliative care is, we need to set expectations of what this new service will deliver uh, in the near future. And we need to clarify the referral process. And the attendees have to leave the presentation understanding the following points, like who will key, uh, place the referrals, like when to refer a patient and why to refer a patient. So what is the clinical eligibility criteria for referral of the patient? and how we communicate a new patient to the palliative care team, either telephonic or on the book or uh, making a direct personal call. And how do we they communicate this new referral to the patient saying, uh, you have a palliative care need and you are being referred for so-and-so reason. So uh, all of these clear cut guidelines and basic things are needed in order to make sure that the referral process from the treating physician to the palliative uh, physician is made very smoothly. So what are the quality indicators? So end of life care is provided in a consistent manner in the organization. And the organization develops written guidance for end of life care based good practices in accordance with the law. This includes appropriate pain and palliative care according to the wishes of the patient and family, sensitively addressing issues such as autopsy, organ donation, respecting patients' values, religion, and cultural preferences, involving the patient and family in all aspects of care, responding to the psychosocial, emotional, spiritual, cultural concerns wherever possible. A multi-professional approach is used to provide end-of-life care interpretation and the team comprising of the doctor, nurse, rehabilitation specialist, preferably trained in the palliative care, form a team and try to address in a multidisciplinary way and end of life care also have unique needs that have to be met by the physician. Symptomatic treatment is provided along with the alleviation of pain. How does a successful integration of palliative service look like? Increasing referral volumes gradually over the time, developing thresholds by additional hiring of the staffs because of the ongoing uh, incremental needs and demands, understanding the reason for referral, the average number of visits per referral and referral sources themselves will direct what kind of an additional staff needed. Suppose the referral sources are end of life care needs or the referral sources include only pain management. We need to make sure that the adequate pharmacy uh, stock is present. We need to make sure that we have acute pain titration nurses who go and handle these acute uh, emergency needs 
and uh, say suppose if we have a lot of patients who are mostly having psychosocial issues for the inpatients we need to make sure that uh, we need to uh, recruit a psychotherapist or a social worker so depending on what uh, need needs based on it like i've mentioned already on a needs based criteria we make sure that which member of the team has more uh, requirement and what these basic requirements are and additional staff has to be recruited based on these uh, requirements building a comprehensive palliative program with clinical service uh, available in a variety of uh, cancer care settings ultimately creates a continuum of support following a patient across the transition throughout the trajectory of the illness so is palliative incorporate setup harming or helping the ecosystem with the population explosion it is difficult with the current model of medical care to meet the needs of so many patients with advancing illnesses increasing geriatric population and consequently both the quality as well as the cost of healthcare particularly people with advanced illness is being compromised so patients with cancer make a significant chunk of the population with high symptom burden so trying to make sure that their symptom burden is met and making sure that they have adequate palliation needs is actually helping the ecosystem in trying to make sure that they are complement throughout the treatment trajectory uh and also patients with metastatic cancers which are usually incurable they live for several years after initial diagnosis so even during their survival period it is very difficult for the primary consultant to make sure that the patient has adequate follow up and keep seeing the same patient again and again on top of new patients that are coming for their uh, medical advices and medical services so such patients when they are on a palliative follow up we make sure that the patient is having very good quality of life throughout their uh, survival span and palliative management focuses on the care of the patients with advanced illnesses or specific symptom burden by emphasizing medically appropriate goal setting honest and open communications both with the patient and family medical symptom assessment and control so this is a, a cross sectional survey that has been conducted in 2025 wherein uh, the iapc standard audit tool was administered to 250 palliative centers in india with an aim to understand the quality care provision in india out of which uh, the response has been uh, uh, good from a private hospital where 63% of the private hospital has responded in uh, uh, answering this quality questionnaire and followed by the government hospital and then the ngos so what a difference can we make the use of a recruitment approach at the time of diagnosis instead of uh, participating near the end of life so that is what i have told at the time of diagnosis when a palliative care physician is included rather than coming at the end of life and painting an entirely different picture complete trust issues arise so by incorporating this early on we can definitely make a difference interdisciplinary management given the multidimensional nature of the palliative intervention trying to facilitate a very smooth transition be it from the er to the palliative ward or from the icu to the palliative ward from the palliative to a hospice all of this is smoothly done early palliative care involvement may benefit the family caregivers emotionally and psychologically by lowering uh, the levels of depression stress caregiver burden psychosocial distress nursing and other team members may also offer the support through education either face to face or telephonic sessions currently noted corporate hospitals with palliative care include fortis delhi max kasar gangaram astra cmi uh, indo american uh, cancer hospital our own hospital site care bangalore amrita kochi rajagiri hospital kochi and pd hindu ja mumbai so uh, coming to the cost implications so this is the most ambiguous part of uh, palliative care uh, initiation how is this reimbursed so the physicians usually can bill for their medical professional time but other allied professions in the interdisciplinary team such as the dietitian counselors social workers they cannot bill for their palliative care services separately 
and however the billing revenue cannot match the program cost due to the time intensive and the team based nature of the clinical work in the usa the hospitals contribute to support palliative care program staff typically by providing 50% of or more of the overall program funding so this investment will be amply repaid through cost avoidance so by reduction in the overall direct cost resulting from the ability of palliative care to clarify the goals reducing unnecessary icu stays hospital admission days pharmaceuticals x rays laboratory costs directly uh, improving the clarity for the referral by all of this they are trying to do a cost cutting so that the hospital do not have to pay the bills for the patient and typically the return on investment is between 2 to 3 dollars saved for every 1 dollar invested in the program what are the other resources to support palliative care and what is the business case the primary argument has always been to improve the care for the patient and the family however a compelling case can be made that palliative care is better care at a cost that we can afford and in most studies actually palliative care has reduced the total cost of care often sustainably avoided hospital and icu days in the last month of life and better satisfaction and communication and cost savings one way that the costs are reduced is through increased and earlier referrals to the hospice in the uh, suppose at our hospital if the palliative care team saw the patients who are in need of a palliative admission we try to make sure that they get admission uh, most of the time the hospital because it is being a trust hospital tries to fund all of the palliative medicines or the hospital billing charges to most of the patients who cannot afford and after their acute palliative needs are met we are making sure that they are being referred to a hospice that is uh, that we have an understanding with after the hospice referral also uh, every week we are trying to make sure that we have a uh, uh, departmental meetings where we make sure that uh, the progress and the status of the patient that we have referred how far it has come whether the patient has been admitted in the hospice or discharged or they were on a home care follow up or if the patient has died all of this we are trying to make sure we are uh, at every point we it either admitted in our hospital in any ward or in the palliative ward or after we are referring them to the hospice we are making sure that the patient that we are getting to the palliative department itself is having a very good comfort care and quality care at each and every step their goals of care are discussed earlier by referring to a palliative setup and inpatient palliative also reduces the cost directly by reducing the length of hospital stay and services that are provided with no impact on the survival again and inpatient care uh, during hospitalization also reduces direct hospital cost avoiding unnecessary icu stay by trying to delineate between the goals of care prognosis advanced care planning and outpatient care offers tremendous value not just to the patients with cancer but also to the clinicians as well as the institution notably this clinical and imperative is aligned with the financial imperative and palliative care results in important cost avoidance cost savings in context of the global care budget however with the goal of making sure that the patient care is consistent and the patient wishes are often met so palliative care at our institution we just started as a pain clinic in 2018 followed by a ctc training program for a uh, cancer training program and now we are a ctc uh, trained center followed by a uh, collaboration of aphn along with aims delhi uh, that is a lion collaboration uh, workshop that has been conducted and an exclusive palliative care ward setup in may 2021 so uh, our outpatient basis has been gradually seen a increasing trend starting from 2018 with 172 referrals with 2019 440 220 728 referrals and 2021 we have around 1093 so all of these numbers indicate the new patients that we are seeing each year apart from the 
previous referrals where we can see that there is, has been an increasing referral volume from the different allied specialities. So this has never been a smooth transition. It has transitioned from a, a key person initiating, trying to make sure we have conducted, the hospital has backed the department in conducting palliative awareness programs for both the patient as well as the, um, the hospital staff. And thus we have seen how uh, the referral volumes have uh, increased over time. So inpatient admissions in 2022 were 338 with 2023 having around 623. The, also, the Institute has uh, taken initiative in giving morphine subsidiaries for the patients who cannot afford. So uh, at our hospital, we have a liaison with the medical oncology team regarding the referral processes, rotation of all the oncology res residents, that is medical, surgical, and radiation in the palliative department for 15 days. And uh, the hospital management is encouraging cross reference with palliative care. We have conducted an LNIC training program for the nurses, sponsored CCEPC course for uh, all the nurses in the palliative ward, celebrated World Hospice and Palliative Care Day on October 14, 2022, by inviting other departments from the hospital to speak on what palliative care is and how it has helped them, them as well. And also we've invited the patient attendees, the deceased patients attendees, to talk about how palliative team has helped them during the last phase. So uh, how do we ensure that we have good quality care by regular audits, nurse education, departmental meetings? So currently there are no NABH norms in a multi-specialty hospital regarding uh, the mandate of a palliative care, but it is being formulated for the future quality care insurance. So uh, this is the uh, guidelines that I've obtained from the NABH uh, standard from 2020, wherein they have mentioned uh, in, uh, under the care of patient heading, they have mentioned that uh, end of life care is provided in a compassionate and considerate manner, wherein they are committed to ensure that end of life care is provided in a consistent manner in the organization in concordance with the legal requirement, making sure that such identification needs are met symptomatic treatment is being provided. So all of this has been a standard of care in the NABH guidelines and also pain management. So quality improvement, care when it is uh, given in high quality, fulfills the healthcare professional, the sense of purpose, and also influences the therapeutic relationships positively, impacts a good patient outcome. And palliative care is innately quality conscious. So, in fact, the emergence of palliative care may be considered as an outcome of quest for the improvement of quality in healthcare. So, these are the core palliative care principles that are aligned with the key values of the healthcare improvement. That is safety, efficiency, effectiveness, equitability, that is non-abandonment and care inputs across different trajectories, diagnosis and age, different timelines and uh, patient prioritized care in transition of the goals of care, shared decision-making um, along with dignity as well as respect. So the audit tool for uh, of the Indian Association of Palliative Care here lists the standard of palliative care services as essential standards and desirable standards. Under essential standards, it includes a trained multidisciplinary team, methodological assessment, documentation, managing the protocols and access to essential medications. Under desirable standards, we have ethical framework in decision-making, collaborative activities in the community, professional development programs. So I therefore want to conclude saying that once conceptual alignment between the organization and the palliative care leadership is achieved, early planning should also include the focused needs-based assessment in order to identify what patients, families, clinicians, and institutions want and the need from most of the palliative specialty team. And building such a Palliative program take years to decades, and in any setting, the provision of the care is based on the needs of the patient and not on the patient's prognosis. And these palliative services in a corporate setup are built piece by piece. Teams and institutions who try to tackle every palliative need everywhere in outpatient, inpatient, or community. They all can be overrun by unmanageable referral volumes, unmet expectations, and strained clinical teams. 
A successful service line launch is ultimately dependent on the development of meaningful relationships between the palliative team and other clinicians within the uh, setup. And uh, prioritizing thoughtful, effective communications with the referring providers and bedside clinicians also help to build the trust and service line success. We, as palliative physicians, serve as eyes, ears of the physicians who work all day in, day out throughout their practice, but are nevertheless have patients who are very sick. This means helping them coordinate care and often conducting repeated lengthy family meetings to help patients and families discuss their situation, arrive at important care decisions. Lead the charge for the change. These are the references and thank you. Uh, Praneet and Divya, so I have joined you. right from the first slide because mm -hmm. I wanted to join and I wanted to attend this lecture. I want to, I have two comments, Divya mm -hmm. and Praneet. Such a beautiful presentation today. So much of clarity you have in your thought process. And this, this can give clarity to many, those who are really get confused in especially in corporate as well as in government hospital everywhere there is a confusion so and Pranit I, I also want to congratulate the number of patients those who are increasing rapidly every year I think this shows that you are proving yourself that you are providing true palliative care in this center and last comment that whether person is poor or rich everybody has a right to get a very important right and important important medical care that is palliative care at the advanced stage of the disease or at end of life care and uh, i think with this presentation everybody anyone anyone can get clarity that what exactly we can provide and we can give so thank you praneet and thank you divya for such a beautiful presentation i'm so happy that uh, i could join right from the first slide Thank you, Pranit. Now you can. Thank you. Thank you very the, much, ma'am, for the very questions. encouraging words. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Diva, for the nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, one thing I would like to clarify here is the corporates uh, which are currently offering palliative care in India, we have included those hospitals to the best of our knowledge. We mm -hmm. might have missed certain uh, hospitals. Uh, so uh, please excuse us if there is any. Uh, Mr. It's okay, Pran it's okay, uh, Pranit. Rapidly, they are increasing rapidly. In, in Delhi, I know every hospital is asking me to provide a palliative care physician. So I know that every hospital is now requiring. Uh, I I can I can tell about Delhi that in Delhi every hospital has palliative care setting, and every those who are not having, they are constantly in touch with me to have a one palliative care physician with them. So I think this is such a great development because clarity is there in thought process. And I think we are moving on the, a very positive side. Anyone has any comments, please? Anyone wants to say anything about the presentation or their comment? So oh, my, one thing I like to add in the uh, with the presentation is uh, like already mentioned the uh, institute has to support a lot uh, in setting up a palliative care uh, department. Uh, in our institute, when we started, we uh, started as a small pain clinic, and then uh, the department gradually progressed. The manpower gradually increased. The numbers increased. So uh, constantly we have been in touch with the department. Our uh, uh, HOD, Dr. Basant, has been a great uh, pillar of support to us. So uh, uh, he has taken certain things uh, in hand, and especially the uh, obtaining the permission to start DNB in palliative medicine, conducting the NIC nursing conference for the nurses, and uh, many um, initiatives that we have taken. Uh, so in the in the in the hospital level now uh, everybody has an awareness of what palliative care is uh, almost every every uh, nurse also they understands why a patient is being referred to a palliative care department because in the, the inpatient nurses whenever they get a call they have to contact us and uh, we uh, they initially they only are telling that the patient is having uh, is called for end of life consultation or a difficult pet consultation um, 
and other things like that. So the awareness levels have increased tremendously uh, and it wouldn't be possible without a good administrative support and somebody Doctor, who is at Dr. administrative Mohan, level. Dr. Mohan Sundar has one comment. Uh, Dr. Mohan, can you please? Dr. Stanley wants to say something. Sorry, Dr. Stanley. Dr. Stanley, you have you have raised your hand. Yeah, can you? Uh, I can't see the. Okay, you I'll can just see. Go ahead. You can yeah. see. You can. We can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Divya and Pranit, for an excellent coverage and a lot of information that you have given. I just have a couple of comments, and it's more of a request to not only you but to all corporate hospitals because. When you say corporate hospitals, you're multi-speciality. And, you know, basing it only on oncology, we are losing out. You know, you're start, starting a good comprehensive service and it must be inclusive of non-cancer also. So that emphasis should come right in the beginning. And that is what I request because then all the corporate hospitals will be geared for this because now everywhere, most places, Cancer is only one third, two thirds are non-cancer. So when you say need-based palliative care, two thirds of your patients will not get, you know, if your emphasis is based mainly on oncology. And the second point is that we must have total integrated service. In other words, for early referral, combined clinics must be common now, commonplace, must be the standard way to approach. Combined clinics with all the specialists, nephrology, cardiology, whatever it is, and geriatrics, and certainly the addition of home care. See, all, unless you have the whole spectrum, you know, we, uh, we have to fast forward our palliative care in Dr. India. Sir, Dr. Mohan, I want to say something in this, that at AIMS, we tried to integrate palliative care in non-malignant diseases, it happened almost over a period of 10 to 15 years. So it is definitely required in non-malignant diseases as well, but it will take some time and every efforts will be an effort. So all, it's not only all over world, it happens that palliative care for cancer patients they are getting, but they are not getting all over the world, non-malignant patients are not getting. So this is true that we should definitely try to integrate but it will take some time. Whosoever wants to, every hospital should try to integrate this care in, in non-malignant diseases. But don't get disheartened because it is going to be a very, very tough job. They are not going to understand. They will take lots and lots of time that you are really required. And every patient is going to be a, 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 to be a success story for you. And it really takes time. So uh, that's why I understand that whole world has not tried to integrate palliative care in non-malignant disease also, but it, 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 was, they, it was not a successful story all over the world. Uh, cancer patients are getting palliative care, but non-malignant disease patients are not getting. But yes, definitely, doctor, as Dr. Stanley said, that we should all try to develop when we are developing for cancer hospitals and when the hospitals where other patients are also getting treated, we should try to integrate. So any other comment? If, if we don't have any other comment, we can, we can stop here. Good morning. I'm Dr. Basan. Um, yes, please. Go from, ahead. Yeah, from Basavatarakam. One of the barriers that uh, we still need to address is... Uh, improving the knowledge in the patients and their families regarding palliative care. Um, uh, can somebody give us some uh, advice on how uh, they do it in their setup? Any patient entering the hospital or the families, they need to know about palliative care so that they can approach palliative care. So what are the so, various Dr. ways in which we can address this? Uh, Dr. Basan, this is the biggest barrier that patient they themselves wants uh, advanced care and they keep on asking that do something for us. But definitely, again, uh, by good communication and again and again, the way you, you have integrated at various levels by good communication, giving them realistic hope and honest information all the time, making them aware. 
uh, this will help in definitely otherwise this is also big, the biggest barrier especially when patient is having all the money and they are rich they want they can afford everything they will keep on asking that there is there but there will be something which you can do for my patient so uh, i think rather than discussing end of life or a uh, negative aspect we can uh, we can tell them that uh, at every stage that we are going you are going through the treatment but there are other symptoms which we we will be able to manage and once the treatment starts failing then we keep on communicating them so that when end will come they will understand themselves and there are very rich hospital the rich patients and ed- very most educated patient in our hospital they straight away ask that we will we would like to only symptom management and we don't want advanced care so i think good communication making them aware and we are also working through government of india that there should be a good educative or uh, uh advert uh, there should be a good advertisement about this uh, palliative care programs so let's see what will happen for that but definitely good communication at every level of the disease will help in this uh, problem so i think if there are no other comments we can stop here no uh, la- last uh, uh, comment madam so uh, in the comments i have seen that uh, insurances are not covering for the palliative care services so what we do is uh, insurances they definitely uh, uh, can raise an objection if there is a patient who is for end of life care or or uh, certainly for pain management or anaesthetic titration some insurance companies are not allowing so what we do is when we write a request for the insurance company for admission we write that patient is being admitted for supportive care we slightly slightly we tweak the symptoms saying that the patient is having a reduced oral intake and difficulty so patient is being admitted for iv fluid so this this slight adjustments we are doing for reducing the financial burden of our patients so then the insurance companies uh, might mm, uh, give us a, a benefit of, of free admission uh, okay so this is one thing thank you here. thank you divya and pratik pranit thank you can stop here thank you also, thank you everyone thank you one more important thing in our journey is what i missed is the uh, joining in the ctc program and uh, getting the dnb approval uh, also with, with the guidance of uh, sushma madam that uh, <clears throat> it actually uh, 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 contributed a significant uh, significantly for the de- development of the department in our hospital as well thank you bhai thank you it was wonderful and so much of clarity and congratulations uh, uh, everyone all all of your team members and your head and your head of the institute and head of the department i really want to congratulate thank you very much see you next monday before 6:30 thank you everyone thank you nisha